Every angler knows that steelhead are extremely difficult to catch on flies. Some people go so far as to call them near impossible. So if you're a trout fisherman interested in stepping up to bigger game, or if you've tried steelheading without the success you'd like, this mastery program, Fly Fishing for Pacific Steelhead, is designed for you. This is the first in a series of three programs that will teach you the classic traditions of fly fishing for steelhead. After viewing this videotape and using the guidebook, you will understand the key principles and techniques that will enable you to go out and catch steelhead on a fly. The two following videotapes will complete your steelhead education with a mastery degree. Your guide to classic steelhead fishing is Lonnie Waller. Lonnie is a noted author and world traveling fly fisherman. He has over 20 years experience fishing for steelhead. The past 18 years have been devoted to fishing for these great game fish with flies only. Aren't they great? Steelhead are large, powerful, migratory rainbows. They are anadromous. This means they hatch in freshwater rivers, mature to enormous sizes in the ocean saltwater, and then return to their original freshwater rivers to spawn. Hi, I'm Lonnie Waller. Everything presented in this tape on fly fishing for steelhead, their feeding behavior, their location in the river, your equipment selection, and your presentation style, everything is affected by one fact. Steelhead are big, strong fish that return to the rivers for only one purpose, to spawn. In this tape, I'll show you how to identify steelhead resting and holding places and how to fish with a plan so you can coax these preoccupied steelhead into taking your fly. Once they're hooked, you'll learn how to fight and land these large fish and how to release them unharmed. Let's begin the understanding of steelhead by looking at their feeding behavior. Steelhead are considered to be the same species as rainbow trout, yet when they return to the rivers as migrating adults, their feeding behavior is very different from trout. In fact, they have no feeding behavior at all. Young steelhead live in the rivers of their origin for varying lengths of time, usually from one to three years. Then they migrate downstream to the ocean where they grow large on the rich bounty of the open sea. Their food consists of small shrimp and other crustaceans until they grow big enough to feed on anchovies, candlefish, herring, and the like. During this period, usually two or three years, they grow many times larger than river rainbows of the same age. Depending upon a number of factors, steelhead can weigh from five to over 30 pounds. When they come back to the rivers to spawn, they have stored up great amounts of energy reserves in the form of fat and muscle tissue. In some cases, enough to last six to nine months without eating. In addition, the spawning instinct has suppressed their appetite. What all this means is that steelhead don't feed on a day-to-day -day basis like trout do. So, you have this large fish coming into the river that doesn't even need to eat, and what's more, doesn't even have much of an appetite. Aha, you say, see, steelhead are near impossible to catch. But here's the paradox. While they don't need to eat and have little appetite, they will take flies. In fact, they'll take flies any time of the year. Steelhead take flies out of a kind of reflex action, or out of habit, if you will. Young steelhead in the river behave like other rainbow trout. They feed regularly on aquatic and terrestrial insects. Years later, when they return from the ocean to spawn, they seem to take flies out of remembrance of their earlier feeding patterns. Think of it as a reflex action. What this means is that you're not going to have to match the hatch like you do with trout. Instead, you'll experiment with different flies to see what color and size might trigger that reflex action on a particular day. Trout are constantly feeding in the stream. The motion they make taking an insect on the surface makes them easy to spot. Because steelhead are not actively feeding like trout, you won't see them as often. 
In fact, on any given day, you probably won't catch as many steelhead as you would trout because there are fewer of them in the river and because they aren't in the river to feed. But whatever you lose in quantity when you move up from trout fishing to steelheading, you'll gain in size, challenge, and most of all, excitement. This is spectacular fishing for the finest trout that swims. And each steelhead is a memorable event in the life of any angler. I define a successful steelhead day as hooking and landing one or two fish. There will be magic days when I catch more, and there will be days when I catch less. But over the season, if I can catch a fish or two each day, I consider that good steelhead fishing. Steelhead are not ordinary trout. Some travel over 500 miles from the ocean to reach the spawning sites. Then they have to go through the rigors of spawning. Their appearance has changed and they bear the marks of a long, arduous trip. The males have taken on darker color with broad red stripes on their sides. On the spawning beds, the males become very aggressive and the competition between them can be fierce. The females use their bodies to dig a depression in the gravel in which the eggs will be laid. Steelhead, like all trout, want clean water and unobstructed gravel, which will allow their eggs to get a good supply of oxygen. Then, after spawning, they begin the long journey back to the ocean. With their energy reserves depleted, only a few will survive to spawn a second or perhaps a third time. But those that do will be giants. Because steelhead are migratory, they can be here today and gone tomorrow. Your first step, therefore, is to determine if the steelhead are in the river you plan to fish. Steelhead are categorized by the time of year they come into the river. Here on the west coast, there are spring, summer, fall, and winter runs of steelhead. Your guidebook has detailed information on the times and durations of each of these runs. You'll find that the best opportunities to take steelhead on flies will come during the warmer months, April through October, because in warmer water, steelhead are more active and therefore more willing to take a fly. Regardless of when they run, steelhead usually come into the river in waves. Then they space out as they move upstream. Your task is to intercept a run of fish as they make their upstream journey. But how will you know when a run is in? Well, most of the runs in well-known rivers have been studied and charted by guides and anglers for decades. So your first source of information is likely to be fishing magazines and books on steelheading. Next, you can check with the state fish and game departments. They can give you more up-to-date information. But before you pack up your waders, you'll need information from someone who lives near the river and actively fishes it. If you don't know guides or anglers to contact, try local tackle shops. There's bound to be someone who's just fished the river and knows if the fish are in. You're looking for current, reliable information, two or three days old at the most. The older the news that a run is on, the less likely that the fish will be there when you arrive. Locating a run of steelhead is the first step. Next, you must learn how and where to present the fly. Now here's the presentation technique that accounts for the majority of steelhead caught on a fly. It's called the downstream swing or the wet fly swing. With this presentation, the fly swings across stream through the suspected lie of the fish. To cover the water systematically, you begin with a fairly short cast of 15 to 20 feet quartering downstream about 45 degrees. Then let your fly swing across until it stops directly below you. The next cast will be two feet longer, still at that same angle. From this first position, you'll continue making longer and longer casts, extending each cast by about two feet until you've reached a limit of what you consider a comfortable casting range. 
Then you take one step downstream and repeat the same long cast over again. At the completion of each swing, you'll take another step downstream and cast again. You'll move through many positions to cover this run. And each time you move, you will repeat the same cast in the same direction. As you can see, this method is very effective because each fish that is resting in this run will have a chance to see your fly. Now, I'll put the downstream swing to work. The Deschutes River in Oregon is world famous for its steelhead. The summer run comes in during mid-July and lasts through October. This water is a good example of a big run on the Steelhead River. The water depth here varies from two to five feet. There are boulders and rocks along the bottom to provide relief from the current. There's deep, slow water above and a heavy riffle below. Steelhead will come up through the heavy water and rest here in this quiet run. The best looking spot is right out there where those rocks are just barely breaking through the surface. Later, I'll tell you why I think so. For now, I'm going to start at the top of the run and work down through all this water. I'm going to use a floating line to fish this run because the water out there is neither very fast or very deep. And because a floating line gives me maximum control over my fly. My leader is 10 feet long and it's tapered down to an eight pound test tippet. The fly I'm going to use is a red winged blackbird. It puts steelhead on the beach. I'll start at the top of the run. It's important to wait out far enough so that when the downstream swing is completed, the fly will hang directly below me in water deep enough to hold fish. That means the water below me should be at least 18 inches deep. There are two key things that I want to emphasize about the downstream swing presentation. One, you've got to cover all the water in a measured, systematic way. And two, you've got to control the speed of your fly as it swings across current. Now, after you cover the close water with a series of short casts, you're going to be casting and fishing with a fixed length of line, allowing the line and the fly to swing across current and coming to a stop directly below you. Then you retrieve your fly a little, take one step downstream, and make exactly the same cast again. That's covering the water in a measured, systematic way with a series of precise, content, concentric fly swings. The second thing you've got to do is control the speed of your fly as it moves across current. Now, you do that in two ways. You do it by mending. And when you mend, make a slow, gentle lift of your rod tip from a low horizontal position. Don't jerk or flip your line or throw a lot of slack upstream. This only disturbs the drift of your fly. Your goal is to produce a steady, slow swing across current. The second way you do that is by following your line with your rod tip as the fly moves downstream. If you do the right kind of mending and following with your rod tip, you will produce a steady, slow swing across current. Now watch what happens if I cast and I don't mend and I don't follow with my rod tip. The current immediately will put a belly on your line, pulling your fly and sweeping it too fast through the current. So you've got to remember to mend and to follow with your rod tip. Remember steelhead aren't in the river here to feed. You've got to make it easy for them to intercept your fly and you do that by producing a slow steady drift by mending and by following with your rod tip. The amount of mending you will do depends on the speed of the current. You'll make more mends on faster water and less mends on slower water. Just remember, steelhead usually like their flies fish slowly. See how I mend to hold the fly at a fairly slow swing. With this floating line, you can judge the speed of the fly by watching the swing of the line. With the downstream swing, there is no slack in the line. The line is pretty much straight from the rod tip to the fly. This way, I can feel the slightest hesitation as it swings across. There will be drag on the fly. This is not a drag-free drift. Now, this cast is far enough out for me, about 60 or 70 feet. 
I can cast farther if I want to, but there's no percentage in that. All it'll do is tire me out faster. So I stay with the length of line that I can handle comfortably while still staying in good water for steelhead. All right, I'm gonna make another mend here, follow my line around with my rod tip. It comes to a slow stop downstream. I'm gonna take one step down and I'm gonna make the same cast again. Make a mend, follow with the rod tip, keep the fly moving steady. Okay, here she comes. It'll swing down below you and stop. The general rule on hooking steelhead is to wait until you feel the fish pull on the line. That way you stand less of a chance of missing a fish if you strike too quickly. I've been thinking about what I'll do if I hook a fish here. The bottom is covered with a lot of large rocks and boulders, and if a fish hits me and decides to run downstream, I'll have to pick my way around these rocks and follow as carefully as I can. Now I'm coming to the best looking part of the run, so I'm gonna slow down, make a few extra casts, and maybe take smaller steps. It looks good, and it feels good. By that I mean that pull of the current on my line confirms my belief that the water below me has exactly the right speed for steelhead. All right, let her swing. I'm gonna make a mend about here. Coming around good. I've covered a lot of water. There's gotta be one here somewhere. I don't, oh, there he is. Woo, it's a runner too. Oh, yeah. All right, get him on the reel now. Calm down, stay calm. Let him run. Okay, now let's see what he's gonna do. All right, he's gonna stop for a minute. I've got a rock I gotta get around here. Check that drag setting. It's tight. Each one of these things is different. You never, never know. You gotta be ready to do any, anything. Keep the pressure on them. Oh, look at that fish. Man, look at that thing, Joe. All right, I'm gonna work him in now if I can. Keep a steady. These things are different than trout. You just can't winky dink around, you, you gotta keep the heat on him a little bit. Oh, look at, he wants to go again. All right, give him a little slack if you have to. Don't, first part of the fight is almost all theirs. You just kind of there for the kicks. He may get, we may get another jump out of him. He feels strong. Get to keep the line up. All right, now I gotta make sure I get that line spool on there evenly. Oh, this is a strong steelhead, I'll tell you. Get that finger moving back and forth. See, that coils the line on the spool so we won't get a backlash later on. With a floating line, you don't have to worry too much about your line or leader tangling on the rocks, so a high rod position isn't quite as important, but we get him in a little bit, we're gonna rock this rod back and forth, keep him a little off balance. You can fight them better with a low rod position like this because they can't adjust to a steady pull all the time. So we're gonna rock him back and forth. Now he's gonna try and rest behind my waders. Now this could be tricky here because he's still green. We got the pressure on him. All right, come around now. Let's see what he's gonna do. Boy, he hit that like a freight. Let's see what he's gonna do, okay. Oh, there's, oh, look at him, he's still great. Look at that, look at that guy go. Boy, I don't know what people do that don't do this for fun. I tell you, one of these makes your whole day, and I've had them that make a whole week. Now, I'm gonna try and not drown here and get out where I can get a look at him. There he comes. Oh, it's a, looks like a nice little female. She's got it right in the, Oh, there's a hole right in the corner of her mouth. Uh, big rock. Okay, baby. You're almost here. Boy, what a grab. Okay. Now I can, now she's getting a little tired. I'm gonna walk her in. You don't want to release these things in heavy water. You want to take them out to the side a little bit where they got a little bit easier to go. Okay, steelhead fever. Not a whopper, but she hit like a, hit, hit like one. These fish here really are grabbing this fly. 
Okay. Now I've just about got her where I want her. Let's see what's down below me here. You got to keep your eye on the fish and where you're walking at the same time. There, let that gray out. That's right, you want that drag to sing when it has to. You don't want to set it too tight, especially when you get in close. They get a little crazy sometimes, and they feel that gravel coming up underneath their stomachs. They go crazy. All right, let's see what we got here. Looks like about, <laughs> oh, scrappy. Oh, nice little fish, okay. Come here, sweetheart. You know I love you more than anybody else in this river, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do a thing to hurt, you won't hurt me and I won't hurt you. Uh, all right, we'll try it again. Come on now. Come on, easy she goes. The leader's strong on here, not so much for the fish, but you need it with all these big rocks out here. Okay. And you want to try and get them in as quick as you can, too. I don't like to see guys that just run around with an hour of the fish on the end of their line. Well, she won't break the record, but she's a beaut. Look at that old red-winged blackbird just fall right out of there. Oh, come on now, come on. Give you a drink now. I'm gonna let you go. You know I'm gonna let you go. In fact, I'll let you go right now. You did good. Okay. Well, she was just about where we thought she'd be. I'm a little nervous here. I've got my leader all wrapped around. Boy, that fun. After you've caught your first steelhead of the day, it gets easier. You have a better chance of catching another because steelhead often travel in groups. And you may have discovered a pattern. That first fish can give you some clues as to the kind of water you'll find other steelhead in, the kind of fly, and the density of the fly line to use that day, and the kind of casting and presentation techniques that are going to work. It all becomes a part of your plan, the strategy you establish for catching steelhead. So, take mental or written notes on what worked, the water conditions, and where the fish was hooked. Over the years, a fishing log will become one of your most valuable possessions. Steelhead mastery is never a matter of luck. It's a process that can be learned over time, and you can get better and better at it. I'm going to finish out this run. If you take a break now and look through your guidebook, you may find things you haven't noticed in this videotape, plus a lot more detailed information. The guidebook can help you shorten the time it takes to learn to become a better steelhead fisherman. That's what this mastery series is all about. I caught a good fish in this water. Now let's talk about how I knew this was good water in the first place. Some of you may say, any run is good water for fish, but that's not always the case with steelhead. Remember, there are fewer of them in a river than there are trout in a stream. That means they can be harder to locate. Part of any successful steelheader's plan is to identify and eliminate as much low potential water as possible. That way, you can focus your fishing time on the high probability areas of the river. So here are some things to think about when hunting for steelhead. Trout will take up a more or less permanent residence in a stream. Their location is determined by where they can feed and where they can be most safe and comfortable as they wait to feed. Steelhead are not in the river permanently, nor are they here to feed. So, they don't view the river as a home to be comfortable in or as a series of feeding stations. They see it as a series of traveling lanes interspersed with holding or resting areas. Knowing when steelhead use these places and what these places look like from the surface, your perspective, are the most important keys to finding steelhead. Try to look at it from the steelhead's point of view. On their way upstream, they negotiate heavy rapids and in some cases, waterfalls. They must conserve their energy at every opportunity in order to survive and spawn. 
So they're going to take the easiest route upstream and look for places to rest along the way. Traveling lanes are the Steelhead's Highway up the river. They are the path of most safety and least resistance. Remember, I'm looking for high probability water, water where I have a good chance of hooking a steelhead. So I like to identify traveling lanes for two reasons. First, I don't want to spend much time fishing in them because steelhead don't usually take flies when they're moving, especially through heavy water. Second, once I've determined the traveling lanes, it's easy to spot places where the fish will stop to rest nearby. And that's where I want to fish. Resting lies are places where steelhead stop for short periods of time, from several hours to a day or two. These lies must be at least a foot and a half deep and offer some protection from the current. Resting water can be a secondary, slower current lane, a slot by the side of a large rock, or the pockets around boulders. Frequently, they will rest in front of a boulder. Resting water can also be located in a run or at the tail out of a pool. Resting water can also be holding water. It depends on the level of the river. I define holding water as any place where steelhead are likely to hold for long periods of time from several days to several weeks. Normally, steelhead will hold in the deeper pools and runs. For example, if steelhead feel too exposed because the water is low and clear, they'll move to deeper water and hold there until the river level rises. Or if the spawning tributary is just too low for them to enter, they will hold in the first deep spot just below the tributary until the water comes up. These traveling, resting, and holding areas are not static places. They change as the water level changes. Normally, I wouldn't expect to find steelhead resting here so close to shore in water this shallow. But if the river were to come up from a heavy rain or a melt-off of some kind, steelhead would move out from the center of the river and slide in next to shore here, resting in the slower currents. I'll point out prime resting and holding lies as I fish different water types. And I'll explain why I think steelhead should be resting there. Each river has its own characteristics. Therefore, the resting and holding water will vary to some degree from river to river. Here are some general principles that will help you find steelhead no matter what stream you're fishing. Mainly, there are two conditions steelhead are looking for protection from current and suitable water depth. The primary condition is protection from the current to conserve their energy. Obviously, it's too fast for a steelhead to rest here. The force of the water would make him work too hard, but they will often be resting here in the seam between the fast and slow water. They don't like the swirling water of eddies. They prefer a more even flow. You will find some steelhead in slower water like this, but they prefer a moderate current speed, like this, and like this, and like this. Look for this current speed and learn to recognize it because steelhead like to rest in it. The second condition is a safe water depth. Steelhead instinctively feel safe in water deep enough to provide cover. The minimum resting depth for steelhead is about a foot and a half of water. When it's that shallow, however, there must be cover of some kind, such as a broken surface water, overhanging vegetation, or dim light conditions. In water over three feet deep, steelhead are usually hard to see. This gives them the feeling of safety. A high probability location for catching steelhead on a fly is from three to six feet deep. If it gets much deeper than six feet, it's difficult to control the presentation and keep the fly deep. 
With the exception of deep runs and pools, reading the surface of the water can help you judge where these two conditions, protection from heavy currents and safe water depth, are present. If they are present, there's a high probability that steelhead will be present too. If the water on top looks choppy or seems to dance, it means that there are usually rocks and boulders breaking up and slowing down the current below. It could be a good stopping place for steelhead. On the other hand, long rolling swells or flat sheets of fast water on the surface may indicate an unobstructed boulder-free bottom where the current is not broken and where it moves faster. This kind of water, with no cover or protection from the swift flow, is not a good place for steelhead to rest to regain their strength. They travel right through it. Now look at this section of water. Where's a good spot with the right speed and the right depth? That's right, that is a good spot. That seam right out there between the fast and slower moving water is about four feet deep and will provide good cover and resting water for any steelhead. If you concentrate on areas like that in your fishing, you will have a high probability for success. To summarize, the guiding rule is that first you identify the traveling lanes and let them lead you to potential resting or holding areas. Then you look at these areas and eliminate the water where the current speed is too fast or too slow, and where the water is less than a foot and a half deep, or over six to eight feet deep. When you can recognize the right current speed and the right depth, you are on your way to finding steelhead. Steelhead that are spooked seem to recover more quickly than trout, and often they return to the same resting place. So once you catch a steelhead, you should rest that spot for about 15 minutes or so, then fish it again. There might be more than one fish there. I'm going to fish this spot where I hook my first steelhead again, but I'll let it rest a little while longer while we look at what helped me land that big rainbow, my fly fishing equipment. Steelhead are big, powerful fish built for stamina under tough conditions. So the most important thing to remember when selecting equipment is that steelhead put more stress on all of your tackle. Trout equipment is delicate compared to the more powerful steelhead equipment. For example, a popular rod for trout might be eight and a half feet long for a five weight line, while steelhead rods are usually nine to ten feet long and handle eight to ten weight lines. You fish for trout in streams which are usually small compared to steelhead rivers. Often you'll have to make longer casts for steelhead. Casting for a whole day with heavier equipment becomes incredibly tiring and a tired angler misses opportunities. For this reason, you need a graphite rod because graphite is both strong and light. That makes casting for distance easier. If I had to choose one rod for steelhead, I'd pick a graphite two, nine and a half foot rod for an eight weight line. This rod would allow me to fish most anywhere from California to Alaska. You'll need a strong, solidly built reel too. It should have a smooth, dependable drag so there's no uneven tension that might break your tippet. An exposed rim on the spool allows you to palm the rim, adding additional drag. And you'll need a reel that can take 150 yards of 20 pound test backing because there will be times when you need it. I use a System 2 because it has all the features I need and it's moderately priced. That way, I can afford extra spools to carry all the lines I need. The density of the fly line determines the rate at which the line will sink. Therefore, you'll need an assortment of lines to enable you to match the sink rate or density of the line to the depth of the fish, the current speed, and your chosen method of presentation. Remember, Steelhead aren't in the rivers to feed, and they will lie at different depths depending on water conditions. You've got to get your fly to them, and the line does this for you. I use several types of weight forward lines, a full floater, the monocore intermediate, and a couple of wet tip lines. And I carry several densities of shooting tapers. 
This system of lines will allow me to fish for steelhead wherever I find them and under all conditions. You'll use leaders from 3 to 14 feet in length. As a general rule, you'll use the shorter leaders with sinking lines and the longer leaders with floating lines. Trout leaders are usually very fine, two to four pound test tippet. Steelhead tippets are much heavier, from six to 15 pound test. That's because of the larger size of the fish and the larger size of the flies. Steelhead flies are almost always larger than trout flies. They are more rugged with stronger, heavier hooks and some are quite a bit more gaudy by comparison. While trout fishing, you may carry literally hundreds of flies. You need only a few dozen steelhead flies. Remember, you're not trying to match the hatch. You're casting to a fish that's not in the river to eat, but will take flies out of reflex or habit. All you're trying to do is find which fly pattern might elicit that response. So, knowing that, I carry a few different colors in several sizes. I always carry a dark pattern that seems to work well in most water conditions, like this skunk, and bright colored flies that show up well in cloudy water. This polar flash is a favorite, and a dull pattern, like this burlap, or this muddler. These are for clear water where a bright or dark fly might spook the fish. When I go deep, I prefer weighted flies, such as this boss. I like barbless hooks because they are easier to remove than barbed hooks, and they're easier on the fish. I'll carry a selection of these wet flies in sizes 8 up to one aught, but mostly I'll use size 6 and size 4. These system fly boxes are the right size for flies, and they float in case I get careless. The Columbia vest holds tons of tackle right at your fingertips, and its larger pockets are perfect for the larger steelhead gear. Neoprene waders are warm, tough, and flexible. Their tapered fit is perfect for deep wading. My boots are felt sold for good traction. And sometimes I add a pair of aluminum stream cleats for more difficult water. A good pair of polarized glasses reduces the glare significantly and helps me make out surface and subsurface features more easily. There is other gear, but these are the key elements. And I think we've rested this water long enough. Let's try that spot again and see if there's another steelhead out there. I learned something on my last pass, so I'm going to stay with the downstream swing and the same system of line, leader, and fly. Make the cast, mend, follow the line with the rod tip, let the fly swing. Now take one step downstream and do it again. Many times I've taken two fish from the same spot. This time, it didn't happen. But it's a good bet that on another day, another steelhead will be resting right out there. And I've got his location in my fishing log. I'm going to move down and check out some of that other water. Why don't you check out this section in the guidebook? You'll find more specific information on the different types of steelhead equipment. Now this is what I call a great steelhead riffle. Lots of anglers pass up this kind of water because they think that they'll only find steelhead in deep pools or runs. What this means is that you are likely to find undisturbed steelhead resting in pockets in a riffle like this, and undisturbed steelhead are more likely to strike your fly. The riffle varies in depth from two to about four feet and it contains a lot of pockets and places where steelhead will rest. But they won't hold for long periods because the water isn't deep enough. Now what about this water at the top of the riffle? It looks too fast, doesn't it? It's unlikely that any steelhead would rest up there in that heavier current. So, I won't fish it. But how about this water down here? The current is slower. There are boulders breaking up the flow and forming a major pocket where the water is over a foot and a half deep. This is good water for steelhead. That means it's a good place to fish. 
I'm going to have to adapt my approach to deal with the faster water, but I'm still fishing with a plan. I'm going to continue with my downstream swing and I'm going to concentrate on the pocket water that I've identified as possible resting lies. I've switched lines this time. I'm using a wet tip high D. The first 10 feet of the line sinks while the rest of the line floats. And I've shortened my leader. It's about four feet. This will help keep my fly down in the heavier, faster water. Now I'm going to stay with the same fly that worked before, a number six red wing blackbird. But this one is weighted with about six turns of lead wire under the dressing to help keep it deep. Steelhead aren't in this riffle to feed like ordinary trout. They're either traveling through or resting near the bottom where they feel safe. And they aren't going to move far in the heavy current to take a fly. My job is to get the fly down to the fish. That's why I've selected a weighted fly and a wet tip high D line. Because the water here is more turbulent, steelhead have trouble seeing or hearing what's happening above the surface. That means you can wade closer to the fish and use shorter casts for greater control. The downstream swing presentation will allow the fly to swing through an arc downstream of my position. But in this faster current, I'll need to cast at a different angle than I did on the slow run. At the upper portion of this riffle, where I'm fishing this seam, I must aim my cast more downstream, at less than a 45 degree angle, and more parallel to the flow to keep the current from pulling my fly too quickly across the lie. I also mend more often, using a shorter mending stroke to help keep the fly deep and swinging at the right speed, about one half the speed of the current. This will give the fish plenty of time to see it and react. Mending is another reason why I'm using a wet tip line. Even though the forward end sinks, the main body of the line floats for easier mending. It's important to spend your fishing time with your fly in the water. False casting does nothing to increase your probability of hooking a steelhead. So, I always make as few false casts as possible. Okay, this cast is out about far enough for me, just about 50 or 60 feet, far enough to swing through the outer reaches of the lies and the pockets. Now I'm gonna follow with my rod tip and I'm going to mend. And when the line swings to a stop directly below me, I'm gonna retrieve the line, take one step downstream and make the same exact cast again. At this lower portion of the riffle, the water picks up speed and gets deeper. So I'm going to modify my presentation again. Now I'll cast almost straight across stream to give the fly time to sink down deeper into that slot. Then I'll give the line a big upstream end to make sure the line is straight when it swings around in the current. I also feed out slack as I mend to let the fly continue to sink. This is a tough one to fish because your fly speed here is uneven because of all the different current speeds out there, but hell, it's still a pretty morning and we're gonna get him. He's there. You have to be a believer. You know, there's a... There's, there is an element of mystery to this. Steelheading is not all an exact science, but that just adds to the excitement. I mean, that's, there is part of it that's an unknown quantity, and that, to me, really puts an extra bit of enjoyment and pleasure in it. Some of these rivers are big and tough, and you've got to really work with confidence. Boy, if I get hit out there, it's going to be a grab, I'll tell you that water is really churning, it's going to really be a soccer. Well, I've fished all the way down this riffle, and I haven't touched a fish. I think I'll come back again and try it this evening when the sun is off the water. Every fisherman has times when nothing seems to work. Lonnie fished the riffle for several hours after the sun left the water but had no success. 
Either the steelhead weren't there, or they just weren't biting. As a steelheader, you've got to have confidence that the fish are out there. And you want to find a fish that'll strike. So it's important to cover the water carefully. But keep moving and show your fly to lots of different fish. I'm going to fish the rest of this riffle, then I'm going to move on downstream. This is a good time for you to look through your guidebook. It can help you focus your attention more accurately on all the details of what I did while fishing this riffle. Here's a deeper, wider, and faster run than we've seen before. It looks like good water for steelhead, but why? Let's take a look. The water in this run is deep, four to eight feet, and it's moving at a moderate current speed. Downstream, there's a section of fast water. After the fish have come upstream through that rough water, they'll be tired. This is a good spot to gather strength before they move upstream. With this depth, steelhead could hold here indefinitely until they are ready to move on. This is ideal steelhead resting water, and now we know why. This whole run looks good, so I'll start at the top and fish it all the way through using the downstream swing. Only this time, I'm going to do it in two passes. The first time through, I'll use fairly short casts, 30 to 40 feet or so. In big water like this, you want to fish for steelhead that might be closest to you first. That way, if there are fish lying close to shore, you won't wait out and spook them. Then I'll come back here and fish through the water again with longer casts using a different line system. I'll have a good chance to take a fish each time I go through the run. For this first pass, I'm going to stay with the system I used in the riffle. The wet tip high D line, the short four foot leader, and a number four weighted red winged blackbird. Remember, I'm trying to get the fly down and fish it across slowly. Okay, I'm gonna cover the water here with a good old downstream swing. I'm gonna make a series of successive casts, each one about a foot or two longer than the previous one, till I reach a comfortable length of casting line. I always mend and follow with the rod tip to give us that steady, deliberate fly swing. You allow the fly to come to a complete stop directly below you, then you retrieve your line, take one step downstream, and make that same cast again. That's covering the water in a measured and systematic way. Now here's something else that I'd like to add to all this. It's what I call the hang down, and you may have seen me doing it earlier. When I make a cast, and my fly is swinging down below me, just as it comes to a stop directly downstream from me, I give the rod a few twitches and sometimes a few pulls with my line hand. This twitches the fly and it's designed to tantalize a steelhead into striking that may have followed my fly around on its swing. And there's something else about the hang down that you should know. As your fly comes to a stop directly below you, you should raise your rod tip up just a little bit to give yourself some slack in your line. This will give you time for the steelhead to take the fly and turn, and then you set the hook. Okay, I'm just about at the end of my first pass through. I'm in the good spot, too. That means I'm gonna slow down, make a few extra casts, cover the water real good. The pull of the current on my line and the swing of my fly tells me that the current speed out there is ideal. Let's make another cast here, get it maybe out just a little bit further. There we go, let's make a mend here. Follow around with your rod tip, nice steady swing. Okay, another mend about here. Okay, now we're coming to the hang down now, so I wanna get my rod up just a little bit, give the fly a few twitches and that's going to tantalize the steelhead that's out there and has followed my fly around, and that slack is going to give me just what I need to get the hook in him. Well, well, what do you know? No steely. Well, I tell you what, it looks as, like, looks as though the red-winged blackbird let me down on this first pass through, but I'm going to go through again with a different fly and a different line. 
We'll get them. One advantage of fishing this two-pass method is that the water at the head of the run gets rested while you fish downstream the first time. I'll go through it again, this time with longer casts and a different line system. On my second pass through, I'm going to need more depth and more distance, so I've changed my tackle system. I'm going to be using a 30-foot high-speed, high-D shooting taper that'll get my fly down deep in a hurry. It's going to be backed by a small diameter level floating shooting line for ease of casting and because it'll give me the distance I need. My leader is still going to be short, about four feet. Now on the business end of all this is going to be a weighted number six green butted skunk. I'm changing flies because sometimes you can change a steelhead's mind on the second pass through by changing your fly. This second time through, when I'm trying for distance, the double haul becomes really important. The speed you get allows you to cast further with less effort. If you don't know how to double haul, take a look at Doug Swisher's tape on advanced casting techniques. You need to know how to double haul on big rivers. Okay, now I'm out about twice as far as I was on my first pass, about 70 or 80 feet. Now, when you've got that much line in the water and a deeply sunken shooting taper, you can't man like you can with a normal line. So I follow the drift by keeping a rod, my rod tip up high, which keeps the floating line off the surface. That slows down the swing of my fly and gives me the kind of steady swing we're looking for. All right, now as the fly comes into the hang down, I'm not going to be able to lift all that deeply sunken line out of the water. So I handle that situation by stripping in several strips of line and place a coil in my mouth until I've got that shooting taper just at the edge of my rod tip. Then I'll roll cast the line up to the surface, turn, flip it forward, and go into my double haul for the second delivery. On his second pass, Lonnie landed two steelhead. The green-butted skunk and deeper presentation made a difference. The first fish was missing its adipose fin, indicating it was a hatchery fish, a female of about 10 pounds. They're all magnificent creatures, and we should do everything we can to ensure continued strong runs of steelhead. Perhaps the most important thing we can do is pay careful attention to the proper way to release a fish unharmed. All right, the first thing I always try and do is release the fish in a current that's slow and easy for them. You want them to revive without a lot of problems, okay? You don't want to release them out in the heavy water. And I'm gonna walk it in. Okay, she's tired, looks like she's ready to come in. Come here, baby. Okay, it looks, oh, it looks like a nice wild fish. As far as I can tell, the dorsal straight and on, none of the fins are clipped. Okay, so it looks like a wild steelhead. Now these are really important fish. You never want to kill a wild steelhead. Now the way to handle them is you get the, you want to keep your hand underneath the fish's stomach to support it, one hand on the tail, head it into a gentle current. Don't release them in the rapids, they don't like that. Okay, I'm letting the water move through the fish's gills. My hook is barbless. It comes out just like it's supposed to. Now I'm gonna face the fish into the current and watch its gills work. And let me move it over here a little fast maybe here. Let me get it a little bit slower water. I always like to do this on my knees too. It's a little bit easier. I'm usually tired. Okay, now you wanna watch the fish's movements and you wanna feel it. When they start to regain their strength, see her start to wiggle there? She'll start to wanna to swim. Don't stop her, just all I'm doing is supporting her while she breathes and gets her strength back. Now when she's ready to go, her swimming motions will become steady and strong. Don't let her go, don't let any of them go until you actually feel that. Don't just get them in and then let them go and walk away. You wanna stay with your fish until you know that it's strong and it's revived. Okay, now sometimes they take a little bit longer and what you can do is move them back and forth. There, see her, see her, she wants to go. She's going, bye bye sweetheart. Well that's not too bad. 
Don't forget to reset your drag after you've just released your fish. You don't want it too loose so it will backlash on the next fish, or you don't want it too tight so they may break you off. All right, so always check that drag setting, then go get your next steelhead. A tail out is where the water from a deep run or a pool begins to pick up speed before it drops into a riffle or rapids. It's a favorite resting place for steelhead because it's the first piece of resting water they come to after working their way up through the fast water below. When you look at a tail out, try to read the water. Look for signs of boulders. They break up the current so steelhead are almost sure to hold near them. Also, watch for deeper slots or depressions in the bottom. Steelhead will rest in hollows under the current and let the fast water pass over them. This whole tail out has the right current speed and depth to hold steelhead. So my plan is to continue with the downstream swing and cover all this great looking water. I like to start at the upper edge where the current begins to pick up some speed. I'll have covered the entire length of this tail out when my fly is swinging through the lip of the rapids below. I like to fish tail outs with a weight forward floating line or a high D wet tip. I can mend them easily for complete control of the speed of my fly. So I'm changing back to a floating line and a longer leader. I'm going to stay with the green butted skunk, but I'm going to change to a fresh fly. Steel headers have to work hard for each and every strike. An easy way to increase your probability of success is to carry and use a file to sharpen your hooks. Factory points are rarely sharp enough, so always sharpen your hook until it will hang in your thumbnail. Steelhead mouths are tough. I like the looks of this tail out, but it's shallow. I think I'll wait until later when the sun's off the water, then I'll have a better chance of catching a steelhead. Oh, this is a nice time of the night and one of my favorite pieces of water. It's right on the tail out. I like to fish them this time of the night because when the light is low, those fish get on the move and they'll come up through that heavy water down below and they'll slide into the tail out and pull over, check into a nice little hotel and just stay there for a while. And it's really a lot of fun because you're, you're usually you're fishing for them in shallow water. You know, a lot of the tail, a lot of the best tail outs are not real deep. You know, sometimes you can find a real good fish, you know, lying in, oh, a couple feet of water. So you can use a floating line like this and your fly is just swimming underneath the surface. So the strikes can really be exciting. Woo, big splasher in a tail out. All right, run, baby. Do it to me. All right. Now let's see, what, it's my, what am I supposed to do here? I'm gonna move down a little bit, what I'm gonna do. Stay on my balance. Geez, what a grab. Look at that thing go. It's almost down to the lip, and it's still on. I'm gonna check my drag. I don't want it too tight when it's that far downstream. All right, here she comes back up. This, oh, he's still going. All right, I'm just gonna stay here. My drag's good, and I keep in a steady, even pressure on them. You can sometimes fool them and make them swim right back up because we don't want them going over the lip of the tail. Steady as she comes. Okay, I'm gonna get off these rocks here and get in a better position. I'm gonna move down a little bit, keep that line up too. And I want the line even on my reel as he runs. All right, now we're gaining a little on him. Now sometimes you can walk him back upstream, just slow and steady pressure. You, here he comes now, he's coming around. Just pump him easy. Oh, no, 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 not yet. Okay, he's strong. Doesn't want to quit, does he? You got to watch it. There he's coming again. Now you get your rod up and shallow out there. I don't want him fouling on the rocks. Okay, here he's coming in. Boy, it's, it won't be hold fast in that fast water. Tough to move. Tough to move. Okay, now it's coming along good. I'll keep this rod tip down low now and just lead him right out. Take a look at where I'm going around these rocks. All right, come on, baby, come on. Now he's coming up again. They'll tell you what they're gonna do. You've gotta listen to them or feel them, really. And the way they shake their heads and move around, they'll let you know what they're doing. Now, now I'm gonna go to work on him. Now it's my turn, I think. 
back and forth for that low rod position because that keeps him off balance. All right, I'm gonna move over with him now. He's going, well, he's helping me out. He's gonna go over the shore. All right, that's exactly what we want. We'll just walk him, oh, he's bucking hard. Walk him over the shore. So let's see if I can get downstream. I'm gonna try and walk him around and then let him drift right back down to me if I can. Boy, what a strike that was. These things hit like a rocket ship. Okay, sweetheart. Come on now. Nope, not ready. Round the old head trick. <laughs> okay. Once again, with feeling now, come on. There, oh, still, still fire left in that fish. Okay, now this way. See, what you wanna do is when they go one way, you've gotta swing your rod over and keep them off balance. Now I'm gonna walk, now we're getting somewhere. The water's heavy here, and even when they're tired, they're hard to move upstream. I'm gonna get down just a little bit. Oh, no, 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 not yet, he's not ready yet. Okay, now we're coming. Now we're coming. Now I'm gonna try and get down below him and see if I can slide him kind of back to me a little bit. Here we come, baby, now easy now, come on. Get him up on your side and scooting right across. I'm gonna let you go. I'm gonna let you go. Looks like it is, it's a hatchery fish. All right. Tricky in this heavy water to cover. Green butted skunk right in the corner of the jaw. All right, darling, I'm gonna let you go because I know you've got more important things to do upstream. You go do them. I'll see you again another year, maybe. Bye bye, kid. All right, that's fun. That is a lot of fun. In this tape, you've learned that steelhead are migratory trout that come into rivers to spawn. This one fact affects everything, including the way we fish for them. It affects their feeding behavior. Steelhead take flies out of reflex or habit, not because they are hungry. Also, their migratory nature affects where you find them in the river. You need reliable information that a run is on, and then you must search for steelhead in resting or holding water where the current speed and water depth are right for the fish. We reviewed the tackle you'll need to handle these river giants, and then you saw me put it to work with a downstream swing, the presentation that accounts for most of the steelhead that are taken on flies. I showed you casting and mending techniques that control the speed and depth of the fly to make it easy for the fish to intercept. I used the downstream swing in riffles, runs, and tail outs, where adapting my line system to the current speed and depth of the water helped get the fly to the fish. Steelhead are difficult to find and sometimes even harder to catch. So I've shown you the importance of fishing with a plan. Remember, store all the information you learn. This will help you catch steelhead more consistently anywhere you choose to fish. In my next program, I'll build on the principles you've learned here, refining them with more advanced techniques in different fishing situations. Then in my third tape, you'll see how everything you've learned is put to the test on an expedition into the wilds of British Columbia for the greatest challenge of all, hunting for the largest steelhead in the world. And that's a trip I'm really looking forward to. This series is designed to help you build the knowledge and skill base you'll need to face the challenge of finding, hooking, and landing steelhead. Take advantage of the guidebook to get the most from these tapes when you review them. Then when you start to put the principles you're learning to use, you'll find you're becoming a master steelhead fisherman.
excitement you're after. Come fishing with the experts from 3M Scientific Anglers and learn ways to catch more and bigger trout on the fly. You'll learn where to find trout in a stream and ways to present the right fly with the perfect cast so you can catch the most elusive trout during hatch and non-hatch situations. Plus, they're steelheading for 20-pound rainbows or going for the ultimate saltwater challenge. Let 3M Scientific Anglers bring home the excitement while you learn a lifetime of mastery techniques that will help you become the best fly fisherman you can be. There's no other sport like fly fishing. It can truly give you a lifetime of discovery and enjoyment. Whether you fish your own favorite stream or travel the world with your fly rod, there's no end to what you'll learn. To help speed you along your path of discovery, Scientific Anglers from 3M has recruited some of the world's best fly fishermen to produce a complete learning system of videotape programs. Unlike simple how-to videos, the Scientific Angler's Mastery Series shows you more than just tips. It gives you an easy-to-learn formula for success to truly help you become a master angler. There are programs designed to give you a strong foundation of knowledge and skill. At the next level, the Mastery System helps you integrate the skills and knowledge into sophisticated fly fishing strategies. And for the expert, there are challenge level programs that offer original and innovative techniques to help you master the most difficult fly fishing situation. Think of it as a learning path towards fly fishing mastery. The tape you just viewed is part of that path. In Doug Swisher's Trout Series, Scientific Anglers presents a four-part program that features a natural learning progression. First, there's basic fly casting where you learn loop control and the principles of throwing a perfect straight line cast. Then you move on to advanced fly casting, building your skills with more complex casting techniques, including curve and reach cast. Now you're ready for action as Strategies for Selective Trout shows you how to fish a hatch from bottom to top. And you'll almost feel the strike as Doug demonstrates ways to take difficult trout in non-hatch conditions. Finally, in advanced strategies for selective trout, Doug teaches you his most sophisticated methods, including ways to successfully fish the midge, how to unlock the mysteries of masking hatches and special streamer tactics to catch big trout. You'll be part of the action as you look through the eyes of the expert and learn the real whys behind the mastery of fly fishing for trout. While you're improving your streamside skills, you may also want to learn to tie your own flies. Gary Borger shows you a step-by-step -step approach to the basics of fly tying. And Doug Swisher demonstrates how to tie flies to match the hatch and his deadly attractor patterns. If you're hooked on catching the big ones, you've got to see the four-part series on fly fishing for Pacific Steelhead. Lonnie Waller and Jim Teeny will provide you with a complete arsenal of skills so that you can take these giant rainbows even in the most challenging conditions. But that's not all. Scientific Anglers takes you south to watch world record holder Billy Pate demonstrate his secrets of success for hooking up and landing the ultimate fly fishing game. And if you love fishing, hunting, and other sports, Think of 3M as your total video resource for outdoor adventure. Explosive action. In-depth information. Incredible scenes. 3M Sportsman's Video Collection brings you the world of bass fishing with America's top anglers like Doug Hannon, Ricky Klein, and Al Linder, a comprehensive learning series that'll make you the best bass angler on your lake. You'll be glad you watch these programs when you catch the bass of a lifetime. The 
the gentle beauty of a deep forest glade. The heart-pounding excitement of a trophy buck in rut. Going one-on-one -on -one with North America's most popular big game animal. That's what deer hunting's all about. And nobody brings you more in-depth information and true life action than the 3M Sportsman's Video Collection. The excitement of calling a bird into your gun. The satisfaction of making a clean shot. And the companionship of a well-trained dog. If you like the challenge of upland, game bird, and waterfowl hunting, 3M Sportsman's video collection gives you the thrill of being there and the knowledge you need to master the sport.